We can produce energy using lots of different things. There are some non-renewable energy sources, including coal, gas, oil, and nuclear. Nuclear is going to be uranium and plutonium, which we use like a rock we dig out of the ground. Now, these are non-renewable because they are a finite resource. Once we've dug them up and used them, we cannot get them again. These take millions and millions of years to... Um, to, to develop, to make themselves underground. Once we dug them up, once we use them, we can't get them again. Now the top three are also fossil fuels. Because once they are burnt, they release a large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is contributing to global warming. And this isn't something we want to happen. Nuclear isn't a fossil fuel because it doesn't release um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but it is non-renewable. There is a large range of renewable energy sources, and the best one um, for the situation will depend on a number of different things. Um, location, direction, um, what the local environment is like. So solar power is going to work best in a south or south uh, southerly um, located place, whether that's going to be on rooftops or whether that's a field. Um, it's going to work better in sunny countries, um, countries which don't get a lot of sun, it's not going to work very well. And the disadvantage of this is it's not very reliable, it doesn't work during the night. Wind is going to work very well on top of hills um, or out to sea, out on the coast. Um, but the disadvantage of this, again, is it's very unreliable because it's not always windy. And some people don't like the look of wind farms. It also kills birds when they fly into them. Hydroelectric power involves building a big dam, pumping the water up to the top, storing it at the top in a big lake, and then releasing it as and when needed. So the advantage of this is that it's more reliable because the water's there ready and waiting for when it's needed. But the disadvantage is that you need to flood a large area of land for this to happen. Waves and tidal obviously need to be in a coastal location and it's going to rely on um, the, the tide coming in and out and the waves going up and down. Again, this is going to be bad for any marine life that is living around there because they may be affected by the uh, machinery that needs to be put in. Geothermal energy is going to work best in countries like Iceland or America where they have large geothermal vents, that's volcanoes underground, doesn't work very well in the UK, but they use the heat from that to turn the turbines. Biofuels can work well anywhere, but you need to grow a lot of things, then you need to burn a lot of things. And obviously the disadvantage of this um, are ethical disadvantages, because could you use whatever you're burning um, to feed people because there are millions of people starving, starving to death um, and here we are burning fuel so that we can watch the football. To produce electricity we need to have a turbine spinning and this turbine spinning and we will go into a generator and this will generate the electricity. Now there are lots of different ways we can get this turbine to spin but the most common one is by the production of steam. Now for steam we need to heat up water and turn the water into steam so it can spin the turbine round and round and round. Now there are loads of different ways that we can um, produce the heat to turn the water into steam. Now this can be by burning things, so burning our non-renewable fossil fuels, so like coal, oil and gas. In a nuclear reactor where the, the nuclear radiation will produce heat and that will turn the water into steam. Or we can set the turbine spinning by a hydroelectric power plant or by waves or wind turbines. We can turn the heat um, from geothermal or biofuels um, into heating up the water and turning it into steam. So all of the different energy sources have their advantages and disadvantages, but they all basically boil down to the same thing. We need to get this turbine here spinning. The national grid is the way that we get electricity from our power stations into our homes. So the power station generates electricity and then a step up transformer is going to increase the voltage so that when um, it goes through the, the pylons, through electricity cables, it is much more efficient so that we don't lose as much um, 
and we don't lose as much electricity on the way. It gets transmitted all over the place through the pylons and then down to a step down transformer so there is a voltage that is safe to enter our houses. Now in the UK that is actually 230 volts. After a step down transformer it can go into our house and we can use it in however we like. There is a lot of maths in physics. There's no way we can get away from this. Physics could be described as maths with a lot of words in and a few graphs. So we need to be really, really good at our maths. And these are the rules that I get my students to follow when we are talking maths questions. First of all, get your magic physics pen. Now my students laugh at me, but this is what I call it. So get a colored pen, get a highlighter, get a different color pen to the one you're writing in. Circle all of the numbers that you can see in the question. Use the units to work out what these numbers mean. Get your formula sheet, find an equation with all of these bits on, write down the formula. Now, this is generally, unless they give it to you, going to be your first mark. Write the numbers under the formula in the right place, do the maths, because that's generally only worth one mark, and then add the units. So even if you've forgotten your calculator, you can still get loads and loads of marks by doing all of these things. Now, units are so, so important. You have to learn these. Um, but there's just no way we can get around this. For any of the maths bits that you need help with, pop over to my website and look at the books that I've got there. Loads and loads of stuff to help you with the maths and physics. You're also going to need to be confident in your standard form, your significant figures, and you are going to be confident in your rounding because these are the sort of things that are really, really likely to come up in the exam as extra little bits, but might not be something you spent too much time on in your physics lessons. My website has loads of resources to help you with this. Here we have a capital P, which is for power. We have current and potential difference. Our potential difference is measured in volts, our current is measured in amps, and power is measured in watts. Here we have one equation that is going to have two different sets of units with it. We're going to have electrical energy, and then we're just going to have normal energy. So for normal energy, we have energy, which is in joules, power, which is in watts, and time, which is in seconds. Now, if we're talking about electrical energy, our units change ever so slightly. For energy, they become kilowatt hours. For power, they become kilowatts. And for time, they become hours. Now, there's no, like, trick or um, surefire way you can know which set of units to use. You just have to look at what they do in the exam question. And then you have to think sensibly. You have to think logically. Are they talking about energy? Are they talking about electrical energy? Um, are they talking, you know, in kilowatts? Are they talking in watts? Are they talking in hours? Are they talking in seconds? And then you need to work out which set of units to use. This is particularly tricky, um, particularly mean, in my opinion, um, a section of the course, um, because it's it they don't give you too much instruction on which set of units to use, but if you get it wrong, they will penalise you by not giving you the marks for the units. There is a definite trend in asking you questions about the cost of electricity. Now, to do this is fairly simple, but they don't give you this equation in the exam. The cost is just the number of kilowatt hours times the price per kilowatt hour. And to add an extra bit of um, complication in this, some of these might have a daily standard charge. So it might be like 20p a day, and then on top of that, it's going to be like 5p per kilowatt um, hour of electricity. This isn't too complicated to work out, but if you don't know the equation in advance, then you're going to get stuck because they do not tell you. If you want to do practice on this and all the other equations, you can go over to my classroom channel or you can pop over to my website and get my book, which has loads of practice equations for you. There are lots of different types of energy that you need to know. And a good way to do this is the acronym Geek's Lunch. Now, you doesn't stand for anything, it's just in there to 
to make up a letter. G stands for gravitational potential energy. This is the potential energy that something has when it's about to fall. So if you're holding a pen up in the air, it has potential energy, gravitational potential energy, because it is about to fall. The first E is electrical. The second E is elastic potential. Um, this is like stretching a hairband. Once you've stretched the hairband, it has a lot of potential energy in there um, because when you let it go, it'll get that energy back um, and you can spring, uh, spring it at somebody. K is kinetic. S is sound. L is light. N is nuclear. C is chemical and H is heat or thermal energy. Now you need to be good at uh, working out what energy goes into something and what energy goes out of something. For example, if we have a light bulb, we know that electrical energy goes into the light bulb, but the energy that comes out is going to be predominantly light, that is our useful energy, and our wasted energy is going to be heat energy and sound energy. Heat energy is the majority of cases going to be the wasted energy. Pretty much everything produces heat as wasted energy. Anything that moves is going to have heat as wasted energy. But when I say it's wasted energy, it doesn't mean it um, is destroyed. It just goes away. It does dissipate. And it dissipates or dissipated into the surroundings. Now, what this means is that it spreads out so much that it's not actually useful energy anymore because energy cannot be created or it cannot be destroyed. It just turns into something else. Or in this case, it dissipates into the surroundings. Sankey diagrams are a visual representation of how efficient something is. The useful energy, the energy in and the wasted energy. So here we're going to have energy in. Going over to the right is going to be useful and then down is going to be wasted. Now these diagrams are um, to scale so we can see here that the bigger arrow is going towards the right so that means there's more wasted and more useful energy than there is wasted energy that is going down. The best way to do this is to like work out the scale or just count the number of squares that you can see on the graph and then remember we need to do useful over total to find the efficiency of something. When we're working out the efficiency of something it doesn't really matter about the units because we can be talking about useful energy or we can be talking about useful, uh, useful power. It doesn't matter about the units because you don't need to put units in the end. You can either leave it as a decimal or you can do it as a percentage and if it's power or if it's energy we treat it exactly the same way. So you need to work out what is useful and put that on the top and what is the total and put that on the bottom. Now sometimes you might have to do a little bit of maths beforehand, they might give you wasted and you'll need to work it out. Um, but just remember, useful goes over the top of total. For loads more practice, you can check out my classroom channel or you can check out my book over on my website. All objects give off infrared radiation. Our main source of infrared radiation is the sun. Now we know this gives off radiation because we know it feels hot and we can see it. And infrared radiation is just waves of radiation or waves of heat coming down and hitting us. Now, depending on what it hits, the type of surface it hits is going to affect what, ha what happens to it. So we can have a dark matte surface or we can have a light shiny surface. Now if we have a dark matte surface, it is going to absorb much more radiation. It is also going to emit a lot of radiation as well. But it is very, very bad reflector. Light shiny surfaces, however, are good reflectors.
but they are poor absorbers and they are poor emitters. Conduction is a way of transferring heat in solids, and this is only going to happen in solids because it involves the particles getting heated up and wiggling around. And once they're wiggling around, they need to bump into the particle next to it. This will make the particle next to it wiggle around, and it will bump into the particle next to it. So by wiggling all the way along, we are going to be transferring the heat energy in the form of kinetic energy from one end to the other end. Now in a non-metal, this happens quite slowly. If you think about cooking, if you're stirring with a wooden spoon, it's not going to heat up, the end of the spoon's not going to heat up straight away, but it will heat up eventually. And the reason because of this is because it's a non-metal and the particles move space quite far apart. If the particles were spaced close together, they wouldn't take very long to bump into each other. But if they're spaced far apart, they do take quite a lot of wiggling before they bump into the one next to it. Now, non-metals have something extra. They have free electrons. And what these free electrons do, and when they get heated up, they start whizzing around all over the place. So these electrons can go over here and they can excite this particle here and cause this one to move and start vibrating, even though the heat's here and this particle has only just started vibrating itself. So the electrons can do lots of whizzing around, exciting particles that are actually quite far away from the source of the heat, which means there are two different ways that they can get heated up or get excited, passing on their energy in a solid. Now this means it's going to happen a lot faster, so conduction in metals happens faster than it happens in non-metals because of the free electrons. Convection is the way that heat is transferred in a fluid. Now this fluid is going to be a liquid or a gas. When our fluid gets heated up, the particles start to move and just as in conduction, they start bumping into each other. After they've been heated up and they move around, they bump into the one next to them and space forms, so they become less dense. When they become less dense, space is in between them and they start to rise. So they move up to the top. Now, when they're at the top, they're not being heated anymore. Because they're not being heated, they have less energy, they're doing less wiggling, they're not bumping into each other, so they start to become more dense. The particles get closer to each other, which means they start to fall. And as they start to fall, they go back to the beginning. And this is a convection current forming, because these particles here that have now become less dense will get heated up again, um, have become more dense, sorry, will get heated up again, become less dense and rise, they'll become more dense and fall, and become less dense and rise, and become more dense and fall. Now this happens in um, radiators, in your central heating, it's going to be what makes... Um, pans boil it's also working on in the um, mantle of the earth causing the tectonic plates to move when we're talking about energy loss from houses there are lots and lots of different things we can do we can install cavity wall insulation now in a brick built house um, there are like two layers of bricks with a gap in between. What they can do is just fill this up with like fluffy stuff. So it's like putting a duvet around the whole house. We can put loft insulation in. Again, this is just like putting a duvet um, on top of the roof of the house because it's made of like a fluffy like fiberglass wool or something like that. All it's going to do is to trap the air in there. It's going to prevent um, convection taking place. So it's going to keep in the house. Now around the doors, we can put draft proofing. So those gaps around doors, we can put like, you know, those big sausage dog things and um, stop air getting out. Windows, we can put in double glazing. Round um, hot water tanks, if people still have them, these can be in the airing cupboard or in the loft, we can put a um, hot water tank jacket. So again, this is just like a big coat around the hot water tank. We can put thick curtains. 
and that will stop heat escaping. Now, when we're talking about installing any of these things, we need to take into account payback time. And payback time is the cost for it to be in installed over the annual savings. For example, draft proofing is pretty cheap to install. It's only going to take like I don't know, maximum 20 quid, but you could save that in a couple of months on your heating bill. Whereas double glazing is going to take tens of thousands of pounds to install, and that may take years and years and years to get back the cost um, in your savings bills. Now, there are other things you need to take into account, like especially with double glazing, you need soundproofing, you need waterproofing. Um, this is more likely to come up as like a big six mark question, um, but make sure you do your calculations for this, because these are going to be really important. And make sure your conversions between um, years, months and days are accurate. The other thing they might ask when talking about insulation is U-values. This is just a value um, as to how good something is at insulating. The lower the U-value, the better the insulator. There are two different waves you need to know about. You need to know about transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Transverse waves are ones that go up and down like this, and longitudinal waves are like sound waves where things are spread out and squashed and spread out and squashed and spread out and squashed. Now you need to be able to label lots of different things on there. So if this is our midpoint of our um, transverse wave, you need to know the midpoint to the top or to the bottom is the amplitude. The, the top of one peak to the top of the other peak is the wavelength. Um, wavelength is measured in lambda. Now the frequency of a wave is the number of waves per second. So if this total thing here was one second, we would get one Maybe like one and a half, just, just under one wave in there per total second. Whereas if here to here was a second, you can see we are getting a lot less waves in. So the frequency is the number of waves per second. When we're labelling a longitudinal wave, what we have are areas of refraction. And compression. Now this is going to be a sound wave, how um, a voice box will um, jiggle the, the sound particles and then that will make its way to you. Now the big difference that you need to know for, for longitudinal and transverse waves is that in a transverse waves the vibrations are perpendicular to the direction of travel. And I'm going to say oscillations, um, because that's just the fancy word for it. And I'm going to say they're tra um, perpendicular to the direction of energy, because um, that, that's what it is, the direction of energy of the waves. Whereas in a longitudinal wave, the oscillations are in the same direction, so they are parallel to so the direction of the energy of the wave. It is really, really important that you use the word energy, not just a movement of the wave or direction of the wave, but the direction of energy or the energy of the wave. When we're talking about the wave equation, we have speed, we have frequency, and then we have lambda over here, which is wavelength. Speed is measured in metres per second, frequency is measured in hertz, 
and meters is measured, a uh, wavelength is measured in meters. Now for frequency, it's really, really important that you have a capital H and lowercase z. Anything else will not get you the marks. So here is the equation for looking at speed, distance, and time. Speed is measured in meters per second. Distance is measured in meters and time is measured in seconds. If they give you any of these in non-standard units, remember you have to convert them into standard units. Here is our electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see as we are going along, we are decreasing the wavelength and we are increasing the frequency. So our wavelength is from here to here. Here we have a very long wavelength, but very low frequency. Here we have a very short wavelength and a very high frequency. These ones over here are also going to have the most energy. Now you not only need to know the order, but you need to know what all the different things do. So radio waves and microwaves are used for communication. So obviously radio, but microwaves are used in your mobile phones. Microwaves are also used for cooking. Infrared waves are used for um, communications as well. So that's going to be the little button on the end of your TV remote control. That's infrared. If you look at it, it's a red button. Visible light is obviously used for seeing things. But an example you can give is a camera. Ultraviolet light is used for like security protecting things, so you can write on something in ultraviolet pen and it won't show up in visible light, but when the police check it, it will show up under um, UV lights. X-rays are used to check people's bones, and then gamma rays can be used for cancer treatment. There are three different types of radiation you need to know about. Alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Now, alpha radiation is 42, and this is a helium nuclei. This is like a big billiard ball. It is big, it is heavy, it is reckless. It is very ionizing. But because it's really big, it can't get very far, so it is stopped easily by skin or paper or anything else. Um, beta particles weigh nothing and have a charge of minus one, which you should be familiar with as an electron. These are kind of like mildly ionizing and they're stopped kind of easily. So they're gonna be stopped by something like aluminum foil. And gamma um, radiation is a wave. So this isn't very ionizing, but it needs something like a thick coating of lead to stop it. Now, gamma radiation can be used for things like cancer treatments because it can get um, inside a person. And then when it gets in there, it can destroy the cells that it is targeted at. Um, beta radiation can be used for things like medical imaging. So you can swallow um, a medical tracer. And because it will get outside your body, the doctors can actually look at where it is and can use that to detect any problems. And alpha radiation is things like um, fire alarms. Redshift happens when stars are moving away from us. Like in the Doppler effect, the wavelength gets stretched out, it goes ever so slightly into the red end of the spectrum, so the stars look red, red shifted. And depending on how red they look, we can tell how far away they are from us. Now the opposite of this is blue shift. where the wavelength is being squashed, so it's being shifted ever so slightly into the blue, and these are the stars that are moving towards us. There are two pieces of evidence we can see today for the Big Bang. This is redshift and cosmic microwave background radiation. So redshift tells us that stars are moving away from us. Now we can make a logical assumption that if stars are moving away from us, at some point they used to be closer to us, or they used to be in the same place as us. So things that are moving away to us, we can work backwards and say they all used to be in the same place. And cosmic microwave background radiation is like the static you get on old-fashioned televisions or radios. And part of that is the leftover sound of the Big Bang we can see it still going on. And it's coming from every single direction in the universe. So every single direction in the universe sounds the same. So both of these put together are evidence for the Big Bang. 
well done for making it to the end guys that was a bit of a hard slog um if there's anything i can help you with please let me know um if you want some extra extension materials pop over to my website and get my book um or you can go and check out the p2 and p3 versions of this video